everybody. We got a great one today, of course, because Joyce Vance is with us again, one of my uh, all-time favorite guests, and she's joined uh, by one of her posse, the brilliant Barbara McQuay. Joyce and Barbara, of course, are MSNBC legal uh, contributors, and uh, they caught my eye on that network and uh, and my ear. Both are uh, former U.S. attorneys, uh, Joyce from the Northern District of Alabama and Barbara from the Eastern District of Michigan, both serving uh, during the Barack Obama administration uh, from 2010 to 2017. They were both U.S. attorneys and now both law professors, Joyce at the University of Alabama and Barbara at the University of Michigan. And every time I hear one or both of them give their analysis of uh, all these complex legal matters, and particularly over this long, tortuous saga of the January 6th insurrection and the myriad of impeachments and crimes and pardons committed and extended <laughs> by Donald Trump uh, since we had the uh, misfortune of his entering our, our daily lives. I, I always learn a lot when I listen to them. Uh, what occasioned this conversation, of course, was the Fulton County Grand Jury wrapping up its work on the uh, small matter of the 2020 Georgia presidential election and the suspicion based on hard to deny audio evidence that Trump and others, including goons like Rudy Giuliani and Mark Meadows and uh, quite a few others, uh, there were 75 people of interest called to testify to uh, the Fulton County Grand Jury, that there may be a, a, a crime or two or three or four or five or more, uh, I suspect, uh, way more uh, committed. Uh, but we don't know yet. Uh, there was a hearing uh, this past week presided over by a Georgia state judge. The media and other uh, interested parties requested that the grand jury uh, report be released, which the judge indicated that he might very well order, which, of course, uh, Fonny Willis, the Fulton County prosecutor, strongly uh, took issue to. Uh, Willis said she objected in part to protect those who may be charged in uh, whatever case or cases that are, are brought. But as uh, Joyce and, and Barbara indicated, and as I suspect, too, it was really to protect her case or cases against uh, whomever is ultimately indicted, of, of course, of course. Now, uh, during our conversation, Joyce and Barbara, or uh, Barbara and Joyce, uh, walk us through some law. There's state law here. This is a, a state case, but it's also clearly a federal case. And if you uh, try to shake down a state official in the matter of a federal election, uh, you've got both. So I uh, asked some obvious questions, which I am never embarrassed to ask, uh, not uh, because I don't know the answers, which I don't, but because I knew you, my audience, wanted accurate and insightful information, which is our credo here. And by that, I mean, first and foremost, accurate, but then insightful. And that's where Barbara and Joyce come in very handy. For example, can the Fulton County DA and the DOJ special prosecutor, Jack Smith, can they talk to each other Can uh, about their respective cases? The answer, of course, is yes, they can. Uh, but I asked it, and I know you're thinking, Al, you were on the Judiciary Committee. Well, yeah, but as I say to Joyce and Barbara, I was not a lawyer, but I played one in a sketch. And that was the only joke of mine that Joyce and Barbara actually laughed at. And the ones they didn't laugh at were... Uh, a couple you may have heard before that other guests have enjoyed, by the way. Uh, there's one uh, where uh, when I record these podcasts, I, like an idiot, have forgotten to turn off my phone. And this has happened more than once, uh, more than twice, actually. And it happened to me once during a taping of a national network TV talk show a few years ago. And because of the stupid thing I continue to do, which is have my phone on, I, I've come up with a line that I, I, I now say every time, which is, I'm sorry I keep my phone on while we're taping, but I do do it because I need a liver, which is a dark joke, but it, it's funny. You see, I need the liver in case I get a phone call saying there's just been a horrible motorcycle accident and we have your liver. 
thing is, when this happened, Barbara and Joyce did not laugh. Uh, but then when Peter sent me the audio file, because I thought, OK, that was funny. Uh why didn't they laugh? Well, the you couldn't hear the phone. I heard the phone loud and clear. <laughs> and I assumed Joyce and Barbara could hear it. And, of course, it makes no sense if you don't hear the phone. I need a liver. So uh, that and there are a couple other jokes I didn't laugh at. But I still think you're going to have fun and learn a lot. It's going to be a lot like camp. So... Uh, coming right up, Joyce Vance and Barb McQuaid. It's a great one, you know, for a change. Thank you guys for joining us. Not only are you former U.S. attorneys, uh, but also now uh, law professors, but also also co-hosts with uh, Kim Atkins and uh, Jill Wine Banks of Sisters in Law. Sisters in in Law is your podcast. Let me ask you uh, this. Are any of you married uh, to the sibling of any of the others? We're not, Al, but we are related in our love for the law. And hence, Sisters in Law. But I, 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 exactly. I, just, I, I had to do that because I have a very literal audience. <laughs> My audience very well. It's actually me. No, and very, I will also, for the record, note that nor is Joyce related to J.D. Vance or former Manhattan D.A. Cyrus Vance. Jr. Thank you so much, Barb. I always appreciate it when somebody gets that out of the way. Yes, I don't blame you, although Cyrus Vance, <laughs> a very distinguished uh, family. Oh, absolutely. No, no disrespect to Mr. Vance. It's just that Joyce would occasionally comment favorably on his activities and people will say, well, what do you expect? They're married. Oh, oh, <laughs> of course, of course. Well, there you go. Uh, th thanks for doing that for Joyce. Saved her ass again. Okay, so um, I, I think we, I want to talk about Bonnie Willis. Now, of course, the, uh, the, the DA for Fulton County this week appeared in court for a judge. And uh, because they, the grand jury hasn't released it obviously that's what the that's what was being talked about or decided or not decided in court this week right right the issue that was teed up was whether or not the grand jury the the uh, investigative grand jury's report should be made public which they had requested and and which um the DA ultimately opposed in court of course Please explain this. Let's go right to this, actually. Uh, explain this to me. If you put out that report, is that normal? Do you put that report out and, and, and give all the people who are ultimately going to be charged and everybody knowledge of that? And, and does that protect people who have been charged or does it protect her case against them? Well, I'll tell you, as a prosecutor, Al, that's the last thing I would want out in the yeah. public domain. It's an unusual situation that they have in Georgia with this special grand jury that only investigates and writes a report and then a subsequent grand jury that can file criminal charges. And I think in this case, because it is so high profile, there is this push to release the report. And maybe it gets released at some point, you know, in government, uh, there is uh, an effort for transparency so the public can know matters of great public interest. But when you have a criminal investigation as a prosecutor, you really want to protect the integrity of the investigation by keeping all of that secret. And then another thing that Fannie Willis said yesterday during the hearing was that she wanted to protect this case and future cases. And I think one thing you would be worried about as a prosecutor is one witness tampering that people will see what the witnesses are about to say and somebody might get a call or some intimidation. And the other is the defendant's right to a fair trial. And so the worst thing that could happen is she tries this case, she gets a conviction, and then on appeal, it gets reversed because the Court of Appeals says they were unable to get a fair trial because the jury pool had been tainted by the pretrial publicity. So from a prosecutor's perspective, I can understand why she would want to keep this under wraps. Let me ask you, when... Uh, and I should know this, but I don't. I was on the Judiciary Committee, you know, in the Senate, but I, I'm not a lawyer, but I played one in a sketch. <laughs> Close enough. When is this stuff released? When does a defendant get to see 
what's in a grand jury report or does a defendant see i don't know uh, does a defendant ultimately get i i, I know from my cousin vinny <laughs> <laughs> pretty accurate by the way yes and and he didn't know <laughs> that the defense uh, but she did Right. Uh, Marissa Tomei's character Mm -hmm. knew that uh, he was entitled to hear. uh, Yeah, about discovery. Yeah, that's right. Okay. He thought he had talked the prosecutor into turning it over and turns out he's entitled to it under under the law. Okay, discovery is different than the grand jury stuff, or is it? Well, in the federal system, you know, witnesses um, or or rather the other side is technically entitled to this material in the course of discovery, and that disclosure can come at different points in time. The same is true in state court. We don't have a system where we believe in trial by ambush. And so at some appropriate point in discovery, this stuff gets turned over. But back to Barb's initial comments, no prosecutor wants to give away a roadmap to their trial, not only because it, it can permit defendants to get their stories straight, it can expose witnesses to harm, but to the point Fonnie Willis made, early disclosure in this case would give any future defendants an argument that they could make on appeal that they had been prejudiced. It might even give them an argument and effort to try to move the case out of Fulton County because of pretrial publicity. And Willis really wants to try her case in her home county. And and that's fair. It's Fulton County voters that were impacted. So she's trying to preserve everyone's legal rights by permitting disclosure of something that ultimately gets into the defense's hand. Ultimately, we probably hear a lot of that in the public. But now is not the time, as one of the prosecutors said uh, to the court yesterday. So how is that timeline determined? And what role does this judge who had this hearing, has has the timing determined? Well, ordinarily, Al, this stuff wouldn't get turned over until after an indictment is filed. And with regard to witness statements themselves in the federal system, you're not even legally required to turn them over until after the witness has testified at trial because it is used for cross-examination purposes, not to go out and dig up dirt on witnesses and other things. So ultimately, the defendant will get that stuff. But to make it public before the case is even charged or before the case is tried would be very irregular. Um, And I think that is what Fannie Willis is seeking to prevent. You know, if after the case is over, the trial is over, then it gets turned over to the public, you know, then maybe it's harmless enough. Although I would argue even then it can be problematic to disclose grand jury testimony because there may be witnesses testified there about things that are uh, shady, but not criminal. We used to call it, you know, uh, slime, not crime. And ordinarily, the grand jury system is designed to protect people from, you know, their their reputation being besmirched when it didn't quite rise to the level of a crime. But, you know, in light of the great public interest here and greater the media interest, I would imagine an adequate compromise could be to disclose this report after the trial is over so that there's no worry that the defendants were tried in the media as opposed to in the courtroom. And did you get any indication from what the judge was saying that that's what's going to happen? I don't know. He, I, Joyce, what do you think? It kind of sounded to me like he, he wanted to be able to give at least something here. I'm with Barb. I think he is leaning towards some form of release that's going to at least make me um, profoundly uncomfortable on Fonnie Willis's behalf. As a prosecutor, of course. Exactly. As, as a public citizen, you know, I'm dying to read it. I know, but as a public citizen, I'm 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 dying for them to be convicted. <laughs> I mean, that's unfair to them. You know, with, <laughs> whoever with they everything are. that we're seeing here, with the impatience about DOJ and other events, there's this tension between wanting it to happen fast and wanting it to happen right and with finality. And I think that's the zeitgeist of the time that we live in. Well, I mean, there is a clock ticking. Um, especially when we're talking about Donald Trump, which is uh, the 2024 election, and he's declared. And of course, what I think I'm hoping for, uh, what I what I know I'm hoping for, 
is that one of the indictments that she is going to announce is she announce she can, she can't announce an adou- indictment until there's an indictment and that has to be done by the actual grand jury, right? Right. There will have to be a grand jury return of an indictment before anything becomes public. Okay, so when she said that some of this stuff this would be coming out fairly soon, what was she talking about? Was she talking about a grand jury is already meeting and about to do this or what? I was going to say, I think what she said is a charging decision is imminent. And so that would require her to assess this report, make a decision herself that, yes, I'd like to go forward. I think that could be done in a matter of probably not days, but weeks, um, you know, a week or two. If When she says imminent, um, I would think, you know, the month of February has a nice ring to it. So what you're saying is that in a few weeks, we will know whether she is going to make charges based on this grand jury report, but not whether a grand jury has a grand jury been named yet or appointed or formed or what ha- what, what what's the verb here? So she'll take this to her regular grand jury, um, which is meeting in session to seek an indictment. You know, I agree with Barb that February has a nice ring to it, but I think we should be cautious about making assumptions about who all she's going to indict. She sent out 18 target letters in the course of her investigation. Well, I'm not going to assume that. I, I, You know, when you assume, you make an ass out of Uma Thurman. Oh, no, Al. <laughs> but um, I'm you sorry. Know, I, I It was good. No, I appreciated it. No, no you didn't. I I think, though, we should remember 16 of her target letters went to Georgia Republican political figures. She seems to have quite a focus on the fake elector scheme. That does not exclude people like Rudy Giuliani, who also got a target letter, nor does it exclude Donald Trump. I just think that it's possible that she might do things in stages. You know, prosecutors love to indict the first group, find some cooperators before they move up the chain. Or her evidence may not reach all the way to Trump. Uh, I, I think we all hope that it does. We all heard the phone call that he made, and it seems like he should be held accountable. We just have to be cautious about our expectations. Speaking of which, Joyce, when uh, you were first on with with uh, on this podcast, you said about this tape, this audio tape, and it was soon after it was released, that it's on tape. Yeah. It's on tape, and he's clearly saying, uh, all I need is 11,780 votes, one more than we have, I think was the verb. And then he threatens him later and said, you know, you can get in big, big trouble, right? Yep. And at the time, you were saying, that is a case. And I continue to think that. I think that that is a case of election interference. There are some issues involving whether or not that's a felony or a misdemeanor, if that's all that you have in in your fact pattern. But I continue to think that there is a good case against the former president here based on what we know. You hear prosecutors like me always caution, maybe there's evidence that we don't know about. Maybe there's something exculpatory. I I know. I've heard you say this a lot. Maybe there's exculpatory evidence, right? We've gotten the January 6th report. What could exculpatory evidence be? Because what we've seen in the January 6th report is that he knew he lost. He was told he lost. In in this tape, he lies a a number of times, right? About, I won by 400,000 votes. I mean, those are lies. Well, and not only is is that the case, but Tim Hafey, Barb's and my former colleague, who was the senior investigative counsel for the committee, did an interview last Friday And Tim, you know, sort of said the same thing. He said, based on what I know about the evidence, I expect he will be indicted. He, I think, was talking about the federal case and special counsel Jack Smith. You know, he had that same caveat. Maybe DOJ gets something we didn't get. Maybe there's something exculpatory that can come up in a lot of different, really strange and weird postures. It can just mean that your evidence fails or it can mean there truly is something exculpatory. Based on what we see publicly, this has always looked like a good case because he's captured on audio 
trying to solicit election interference. Yeah, and I'll just uh, add to, to Joyce's comments there. And let me start from the proposition that I fully expect indictments to come both from Georgia and from the DOJ. But uh, what could be exculpatory? I'll tell you what could be exculpatory. There was another conversation uh, in which Donald Trump says, I, I only want the, the votes I believe I'm, I'm properly entitled to. I think you got it wrong. I want you to go back and check. I wasn't asking you to give me votes fraudulently. I thought that you made a mistake and that I'm entitled to those. Now, that sounds like fiction to me. That doesn't sound right. Well, but if that, that was, happened, he did record that um, several weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> but that's I the mean, kind of thing that could be exculpatory, right? And and even that may be enough And the, the Justice Department or, or Fannie Willis says, I'm willing to take my chances with that. But those are the kinds of things. So you have to prove that when he made the statement, the statement's bad, uh, and it's probably the centerpiece of a case. But you have to make sure that you can show that he had criminal intent at the time, that he knew it was fraudulent and he was asking Brad Raffensperger to do something illegal by you know, cheating in the election. Well, we'll go to my point about some of the things he said that he knew were not true in this because he said something like, I won my 400,000 votes. Didn't he say that in this tape? Some huge number. Mm -hmm. And he was told over and over again by then many times that, no, we have not uncovered anything. We've looked at all of this. There's nothing, nothing that suggests there was any widespread fraud at all. And, and I agree with you. And that's the reason I think charges are likely to come. But are there witnesses out there that we have not heard from who said things like, oh, well, on other occasions, he was told that there probably is fraud. John Eastman is talking in his ear all the time. They're wrong. I'm right. This this is uh, there's absolute fraud there. Those people are too lazy. They don't want to find it or they don't believe it. Um, we haven't heard from those witnesses. We only heard from the witnesses who make the case, not from any defense witnesses. I see. But but he did also say to witnesses who made made the case that he said, we can't tell people I lost. It's embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. no, I agree. I think it's going to help a lot. <laughs> but there's an additional issue here. It's not just the facts. It's also about the law, right? Because criminal law is statutory law. So Fannie Willis has to find Georgia state crimes that she can charge. And Georgia state law on elections is not as expansive as federal law. I think that there are more choices in federal law. She does have this election interference crime. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but it looks like it's largely a misdemeanor to me. There is some talk that she might charge a RICO case or that she might charge some form of wire fraud. So there are lots of options here. Well, let's explain, uh, explain RICO. That is a racketeering case, right? Right. And that means that there are some people plotting something, a number of people. That's sort of, you know, crime family, right? These sort of racketeering statutes are used for ongoing criminal activity, organized criminal activity. Willis has some experience in this area. She's indicted under this statute. Georgia has a broad and expansive RICO statute. So there's been a lot of speculation that she plans to use it here. OK, so beyond the tape, of course, there <laughs> there is how, how, how many people testified before the grand jury? She said 75 witnesses. Yeah. OK, so and and some of these people are involved like electors and uh, or the fake electors that we call them or the people who are uh, Giuliani and uh, and 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 others who were trying to were talking to the fake electors, including did Trump talk to them? I think there was evidence from Ronna Romney McDaniel that Trump talked to her about helping to orchestrate it. You know, in the public domain, I don't know that there's evidence that he talked directly to them. But I suppose that's a question you ask them when you call them to the grand jury. Right. And so, I mean, obviously, there's a whole bunch here. We have no clue what's there and what isn't there. And my suspicion would be having done how, how many months was this? going on like eight months how long was this yeah i think that's right the grand jury gets signed off on by the court i think nine months and then it takes them about a month to get going and, and they run for eight months okay so in eight months of calling 75 witnesses you have to think that they found stuff right <laughs> so certainly they found stuff the question is whether they found 
proof beyond a reasonable doubt of each and every element of a crime that's already on the books. So, you know, the, the, we talked about crime, not slime. The phrase is uh, awful, but lawful. So it has to meet the elements of a specific offense. But, you know, based on all the things Fannie Willis said yesterday, based on all the things that we know from the January 6th uh, committee hearings, it seems likely that there is sufficient evidence of crimes there. And to your point about RICO, Al, I think RICO is a real possibility here because number one, we know that Fannie Willis has used it in a number of contexts, including against violent street gangs. And it allows a prosecutor to pull together a lot of different crimes into one umbrella so that a jury understands the full scope of the criminal activity. So here, it's not just the call with Brad Raffensperger. It's also the fake electors. It's also Rudy Giuliani going before the legislature and lying to them about uh, fraud with you know suitcases and other things. It is also about threats to Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. It is also about tampering with voting machines. So with a RICO, you could bring all of that together in one case as a criminal enterprise, which is why I think there's a very real possibility she might bring that. So when we find this out, she, she's saying pretty soon we're going to find out who I'm charging or. You know, she said her decisions were imminent and Imminent. You know, I have pondered what does imminent mean as a prosecutor? If I said something was imminent, what what did that what was the content? Imminent is a pretty strong word. I mean, it sounds to me like something where you're days, maybe weeks away. I don't know how deliberate her word choice was, but it certainly um, got my attention. Now, she she can only bring state charges, of course. Right. Right. So now if she does. Uh, and I, Donald Trump, and he's convicted on state charges, uh, and it's more than a misdemeanor, say, can uh, the governor pardon him? Georgia has an unusual procedure where the power of the pardon is not held by the executive. It's actually held by a group, by a board that makes those decisions. So Kemp wouldn't be able to get Trump off the hook. Of course, there would be issues involving the composition of that group and what kind of a decision they might reach. My understanding, though, is that it's bipartisan and that people don't see that as an escape valve for Trump. Oh, I see. Oh, that's that's interesting. Georgia is really unusual in some very quirky ways as America is learning. Well, uh, every state is different, but that does sound different from (laughs) uh, Michigan. And Alabama. Yeah, absolutely. And from our the federal system that Barb and I are used to. It's well, just speaking a whole of the federal system. Of fish. Speaking of the federal system, so there it, there must be overlap between a crime in Georgia and and a, a federal crime, right? Yep. Yes. So do she and Jack Smith do they share this information with each other? They can do that, right? Well, the law does permit you to to share information from the federal to the state. I don't know whether Georgia grand jury laws allow them to share it the other way. Um, if it is grand jury material, usually there is that sort of reciprocity going back and forth. Sometimes people get a little turfy about sharing information, but I have always found the best practice is to be collaborative because sometimes one jurisdiction has a statute that fits the facts better than the other jurisdiction. And it also makes sense to coordinate so you're not stepping on each other. You know, you want to make sure someone didn't give conflicting statements in one jurisdiction versus another and the like. So I, I would be hopeful that they are at least communicating with each other and coordinating their plans. When, when did uh, DOJ call its grand jury? Do we know that? You know, every appearance was that DOJ, and I think Barb and I may have a little difference of opinion here, but but at least my impression was that DOJ, for the first year that Merrick Garland was in office, was not really investigating, wasn't really interested in, in pushing this for whatever reason, but that sometime around December or maybe the following January, they got a pulse. There were some proceedings in front of grand jury. I'm not sure if it's that early or if it's happening on a March or an April timeline. And from that point on, and maybe this has something to do with the discovery of documents at Mar-a-Lago, then there's a lot more of an interest. Yeah, well, we'll get to the documents case, which has been complicated, I would say, uh, in a way. 
right, by the discovery at uh, Biden's residence and now at Pence's residence, but not really, I don't think. I mean, obviously, there's a the, the difference is that they weren't obstructing anything, right? Yeah, I, I think these cases are very different. You know, I think it's easy to equate the situation with Trump, Biden and Pence because they all involve classified documents. But, you know, it's like comparing a fender bender, but is caused by accident with intentionally driving your car through a crowd of people. You know, they both involve cars, but they're the similarities. Yeah, it's, it's the difference between Charlottesville and a fender bender. Yeah, car. right. I mean, these are very different things. And so, you but know, that I'm doesn't gonna, matter. Does that no, matter? Not, <laughs> I mean, does that matter to the public? I mean, well, politically, I think it's problematic for Biden and Pence. It's very careless. I think that, you know, we should judge them harshly politically for mishandling classified information, which is the nation's, you know, secrets uh, that exposes us to exceptionally grave harm if they're released beyond those authorized to have them. So it is a big deal. But in terms of whether it's a crime, you know, I think so far I haven't seen anything to suggest that what Biden did or what Pence did is a crime. No. Whereas in the case of Trump, he willfully retained them, which makes it clearly a crime. a crime. And then, you know, it appears defied a grand jury subpoena that asked for the documents. They gave back only a small quantity and still retained more than 20 boxes in the basement. So I think they're extremely different cases. No excuses for Biden or Pence. What they did was wrong, but not criminal. And yet the optics are such that because I remember I had Neil Kachial on, on the podcast a number of months ago and said, OK, do you just do the one that's easy to prove, <laughs> which is the documents? Or do you do the one that is, oh, crap. Oh, crap. Sorry. I, I need a liver. And that's why I have to have my phone on at all times. Ah. Uh. I was lying about that. <laughs> they usually get sympathy from the crowd, I suppose. It works. Yeah. Well, uh, that went over as well as the Uma joke. <laughs> We're a tough crowd. I mean, Barb and me. No, We're no. Tough. We're prosecutors, man. Don't mess with us. But I have that line ready, the liver line, because I've done this before. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I apologize for that. <laughs> okay. So uh, where, where were we before I so rudely allowed us to be interrupted? Well, we were, you were talking about Neil and, and talking with him about going after the Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I said, yeah. which you do, the easy one, <laughs> the proof, which is the documents. I mean, he had no right to these. And then he lied about it and did it kind of a number of times, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't think it's any substitute for what happened on January 6th. I mean, no. I think, I think, I think we, frankly, you probably could, could do both. But, you know, mishandling classified documents is a serious crime. You need to be uniform in how you enforce the law because ordinary government employees are charged with these kinds of crimes all the time. I think you have to think about, you know, what are the factors you ordinarily consider? And if Donald Trump violated those same factors, then you charge him. That doesn't mean you don't charge him for January 6th, because I think that was such a profound crime against our country. No, it's the worst crime you can commit. To me, this is seditious conspiracy um, with the Oath Keepers. Mm -hmm. We're just uh, convicted four of them again. How many is that now? Eight? Let's see. Two the first go round. And was it four or five this time? But uh, you're four. right. It's oh, getting it's only up six. there. Yeah. OK. And that's usually a hard conviction to get. And, and Barb, we, we talked a little bit about this before yep. Joyce came on, which mm -hmm. is you had a case in 2012, yeah. which involved the Michigan militia. Yeah. And, and they were acquitted at, at trial. And, you know, it was a case where a group was uh, plotting to kill police officers and federal agents, uh, in part because they wanted to ignite a civil war. And I think that there is a reluctance by the public to believe that, you know, people really want to do this. Like, Really? People really think this is how they could do this? And I think right. that just brought us together. Now, you know, 10 years later, I think maybe the public is a little more savvy about, yes, there really are people who believe this and want this. So it is hard. Um, so I think DOJ is to be applauded for seeking these charges and obtaining these convictions. But I will tell you that if ever there is a place for seditious conspiracy, which requires proof of the use of force to oppose the authority of the United States, it has to be when you use violence at the Capitol to prevent the lawful transfer of presidential power. 
And so the facts in this case are about as strong as I could imagine. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But also the Oath Keepers. Okay. You're going to hate this joke. (laughs) Okay. Try us. Okay. Let me try this. Uh, The reason the Oath Keepers were easy to convict of seditious conspiracy is that their oath is, I swear I will conspire to commit (laughs) sedition. Mm, I kept that one, huh? <laughs> that's that's a conspiracy, that right? That's 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 great proof if you can prove that's the oath. That was that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you see mm-hmm. that their literal oath. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it's a little bit better than the Proud Boys memo that got released this week, right? So we'll give you credit for that one. What was that? What was the Proud oh, it Boys was awful. memo? It was like. 11 or 12 page document where they talked about what proud boys had to do to become proud boys of increasingly more important degree. And it was, um, it was pretty interesting. So um, what is the range of stuff that can come out of this grand jury in terms of charges? Like can Lindsey Graham, you know, I, 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 I texted Lindsey. I said, look, just tell the truth and you have nothing to worry about. Okay, that was another attempt. Yeah, I was referring to that. Another joke. All right. Yeah, yeah. Are you workshopping this? Is this for a show? Uh, it's for a podcast, uh, the Al Franken podcast. All right. And in it, I use my uh, the, the the chops I developed mm. over years in comedy, <laughs> and also on the Judiciary Committee. But I mean, Lindsay. He was called because he he talked to Raffensperger himself, right? A number, a couple of times? Well, he did. And my impression was that Willis seemed to be treating him. She may have even implied that he was a witness, not a defendant. But you'll recall he actually litigated whether he had to comply with the subpoena. Sure argued what he was doing was covered by something that you know far more about than I do, the speech and debate clause. Yeah, and it was bogus. ultimately, he was ordered to testify about, you know, stuff he did that was not part of his um, congressional fact-finding mission. Which was basically asking Raffensperger to get rid of some votes, right? Well, that's what we think. Yeah, you know, I don't know what he said. And also keep in mind that Lindsey Graham could have invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. You know, if they say, what did you say to Brad Raffensperger? But as Joyce said, he has been kind of characterized more as a witness. But I would think that the content of that call, you know, if if it was nefarious, if he was asking Raffensperger to help Trump win Georgia, there's at least some potential criminal exposure there. Hey, Barb, wouldn't you rather have him as a cooperating witness than as a defendant? He might be somebody who could really talk about Trump's mindset, and it might be tough to convict him because of the the privilege issues. I'd sort of like to have him as a cooperator if I was funny. Yeah, I guess it depends on the facts. It depends on what he said, what he did, and why he did it. But if he's got uh, inside evidence against Trump or Giuliani, then you know he might he might make a good witness. Now, Giuliani. I mean, okay, Lindsay, there's some specu- speculation there, which says somehow I don't believe that that could possibly happen to Lindsay. But Giuliani, my goodness, doesn't it seem like he is very exposed? He received a target letter. That looks like exposure to me. Okay, well, to explain a target letter. You're, you, it's saying you're a target, right? Yeah, so it, this actually is unusual. Willis's office typically doesn't do this. This happens in the federal government where uh, on occasion um, someone either at their request, if they ask what their status is or prosecutors may just advise them that they're viewed as a target of an investigation, which means that prosecutors believe that they have sufficient evidence to bring them within the ambit of the crime that's being investigated and that they expect that they will charge them. I don't know how close to that federal meaning Willis hewed when she sent these letters out, but she did send one to Giuliani reportedly. Who else did uh, she she called Flynn? uh, Yes. And I think Mark Meadows. We don't know if Meadows testified, which is sort of interesting. Yeah. He was like he failed in his legal challenges. And still, he possibly didn't testify. I think it's likely that he did and he took the fifth a lot, but I think we it's don't know that for certain. So uh, Meadows 
it, I mean, obviously, uh, Cassie Hutchinson talked a lot about her conversations with Meadows because she worked directly with him. And it feels very much like he was at the very center of this, does it not? Meadows came down to Georgia. He actually showed up um, as ballots were being counted. He's the guy who set up Trump's phone call with Raffensperger. And an interesting detail is, you know, the fact that Raffensperger was taping this phone call when Trump called him suggests that he had a little bit of a heads up that not all was right in his world. Hutchinson did suggest that Meadows had been talking with other Georgia politicians. It's highly likely that there was some uncomfortable content in those phone calls and that Willis would have been able to get testimony about that in her grand jury that led to Raffensperger taking this remarkable step, right, of taping a phone call with the president of the United States without letting him know that he was doing that, a member of the president's own party. I don't think that is so extraordinary because I mean, didn't, didn't Trump repeatedly, repeatedly try to call him? And isn't Trump someone who you cannot trust? Right. I mean, you know, that's that- your view and that's my view. But this is a member of his own party. And it seems to me that it is remarkable that, you know, the Georgia secretary of state thought he needed to tape this call for his protection. There's no other reason you'd tape it. But by this point, this is the, the call was January 2nd. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And I would think that at this point. Raffensperger had to believe because of the things that Trump was saying publicly that that weren't true, (laughs) that if he got a call from Trump, that Trump would mischaracterize it and that for his own protection, he would have to tape this thing. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that I don't find it surprising at this point. It's January 2nd. If you are Brad Raffensperger, by this point, you know that this guy is not to be trusted in any way, as if you needed to <laughs> needed to know it needed to wait till January 2nd, 2021 <laughs> to know that if you're a yeah, human and, being in America. And I think the question I would ask everyone involved is, was this the first and only call? You know, there, there no. seems like... Right. There are other communications. And so by January 2nd, you know, he knows why Trump is calling. Were there subsequent calls? I mean, I think there's been reporting that Meadows went down there to Georgia and talked to them. So what happened in those calls? And those calls could be important context to help support the claim that when he asked for the 11,780 votes, everybody knows it's fraudulent. Oh, oh, when when I said were there other calls, I meant what I meant was that Trump had tried to repeatedly over and over and over again get Raffensperger. So by then, I I can't remember how many of these there were, but it was repeatedly and Raffensperger was avoiding his call. Yeah, you know, I think that that's exactly right. And to your point about what's Mark Meadows' role in that, I think Meadows was involved in trying to set up that call and also possibly calls with other people in Georgia. So Willis may know a lot that we don't know about Mark Meadows and about how this played out generally. I I have the suspicion that after calling 75 witnesses and this going on for eight months, that she better know a lot that we don't know. (laughs) Right? Usually that's true for prosecutors. Yeah, I think it's a safe bet. Yeah. And so, and we don't know what we don't know, right? Yes. So I suspect that what we don't know it has some pretty spectacular stuff in it. I mean, you guys have maybe. done this before. <laughs> yeah. This is what maybe you maybe did. Yes, maybe no. I don't know. You always want the smoking gun when you're the prosecutor, right? We just don't know what she has. Right. When will we get a really good indication? And now this is, I should tell our listeners that we are recording this on Wednesday. This is going to drop on Sunday morning. Do you think by then we'll know a lot more about what she has? Or do you suspect that it's going to be, take a lot longer than that or somewhat longer than that? I think it's going to be longer, but I think one day we are going to either, but but I don't think much longer because she said that her decision is imminent. And so I think within the next month, 
We are either going to hear her announce a grand jury has indicted the following people or, and you know, here's a copy of the indictment, or after great reflection, I have concluded that an indictment is not appropriate here. I think we're going to hear one or the other of those two things in the next month-ish. And at, at that moment, about, I don't know, 100 million people go like, if, if they say <laughs> there's not enough <laughs> for an indictment, you'll hear just like, oh. Yeah, I, I'd be surprised if that's the outcome. Although, as Joyce mentioned earlier, it could be that you see this in several phases. So it may be indictment one is the fake electors, and people are frustrated that it doesn't include Trump. Um, right. If that's the case, I would say, you know, but does she go you know, wait, hold on, wait. there could be more. Yeah. Yeah. And that seems like a very likely scenario. Yes. Okay. So you, you, you obviously very closely watched the January 6th hearings. One of the things that I'm very curious about, and Mark Meadows is so much at the center of this, and Cassie Hutchinson said that he really wanted to get to the Willard Hotel. To be with the, uh, what was the uh, group? It had yeah, the war room. The yeah, war room. The war room. The separate war, room. war rooms, right? The, the um, Bannon war room and the Flynn war room. My, and, and Bannon and, well, and, and Flynn and, uh, and Stone. Was Stone in that war room too? Yeah. Okay. Now, think about those people. <laughs> I, I have been disappointed that we haven't heard more about that war room. I'm wondering what your opinion is in terms of, do we find out what happened in that war room somehow? You don't know. I know. I too am, am desperately curious about that aspect of things. One of the reasons it may be tough to get in there is that's obviously a tightly knit group of people um, that doesn't want to go to jail. Um, so they've, you know, there's obviously some sort of loyalty among thieves there. One of the hopes with the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys seditious conspiracy cases, because both of those groups were involved in um, providing security services for some of the people involved there. And at least in the case of uh, the Oath Keepers, their leader had suggested that he had some sort of an insider input or insider access at the White House. The thought had been, OK, maybe these folks get convicted and then they decide that they don't really want to spend 10, 15 years, whatever the sentence is in prison, and they'd like to cooperate to try to limit their exposure. I think that there has been some hope of that slow rolling build as a way to get access to what was going on at the Willard. Did anyone from the Oath Keepers or the Proud Boys plead before they were convicted? I mean... Yes, there there were two or three Oath Keepers who've pled guilty to seditious conspiracy. Yeah, there's an Alabama man who pled guilty, who was involved in providing security. And I'm forgetting now if it was for Roger Stone or someone else. I'm not sure if those sort of folks had enough high level cooperation sure. or if you really have to get to, you know, Stuart Rhodes or Enrique Tario, the leader of the Proud Boys, to have access to that kind of information. Okay, here's one who could be the key to all of it. Ooh. Combining the Mar-a-Lago case with the January 6th case Ooh. in the Willard Hotel war room Ooh. and in the basement at Mar-a-Lago, attorney Christina Bob. Wait, is this Clue? Are we playing Clue now? <laughs> Colonel Mustard uh, with the revolver. <laughs> um, no, like if she's got exposure in the Mar-a-Lago case, you could flip her and say what happened in the Willard Hotel war room. She was in yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. Was well, speaking of flipping, the lawyer who told uh, Hutchinson <laughs> to say, I don't recall, mm. even when she did recall, <laughs> the, the thing that the, the Justice Department can do that the January 6th committee couldn't do, they can flip people. Yes. So uh, you are guys are for federal prosecutors. What do you see the chances are that there is going to be a lot of flipping happening uh, on the road to, to all of this? So Trump has been remarkably fortunate in that no one really over time has wanted to flip against him. The one big exception being his lawyer, Michael Cohen, who flips, who gets prosecuted in the Southern District of New York. The Pross memo reads like a roadmap to getting Trump and nothing happens. Cohen goes to prison. 
Trump never gets prosecuted. You have to wonder if that further insulates the former president from people being willing to testify against him. There's obviously this interesting movement going on in the Manhattan DA's office where there's speculation that the criminal case there against Trump over allegations involving his private business may be live again. And if that happened, you know, that would likely happen because of cooperators and it might set things on a different footing. But Barb, I'm curious what you think about this. I'm not sure that I've ever seen someone who was so very insulated with so many people who were willing to either go to prison or run the risk of committing perjury or or other risk of, of getting a foul of federal prosecutors in order to protect somebody at the top just refusing to cooperate. Yeah, it's kind of like a crime family, isn't it? The other example, Joyce, is uh, Mike Flynn, who kind of originally went down this path. Remember, he's going to plead guilty. Yeah. He's all on board. He was sorry and remorse and all that. And then the judge was appalled that he was going to get, uh, I think, a sentence of probation in light of his disloyalty to the United States and said, I don't know, I need to think about this. And in the interim, uh, Flynn changed his mind and said, yeah. I'm not going to cooperate. So something caused him to change his mind. And he he realized that uh, he could do better for himself by remaining loyal to Donald Trump and, you know, get get the pardon that he later got. So it, it is interesting. But I don't know, I think just in the same way you get there's a Sammy the Bull Gravano in every crime organization. It's just a matter of finding the right one who is willing to tell the truth. Michael Cohen appears to have been one. So there, you know, there may be others, Christina Bob or others who were in the Willard Hotel who, you know, want to have a career. Mark Meadows may want to have a career at some point. Um, you may be able to get him to flip. But I don't know. Um, it'll it'll remain to be seen. But for sure, that is something that the Justice Department will be pursuing to see if they can find people that they can try to induce to plead guilty in exchange for uh, leniency and providing information about other people whose conduct was more egregious or higher up in stature, like a president or, you know, someone with... Well, I'm uh, someone like the lawyer who said to Cassie Hutchinson, you can say, I don't recall, even if you do recall. That's a lower level, right? But that person presumably could be made to flip and then flip a little higher and a little higher and a little higher. Is that the way things are very often done anyway? You know, with that lawyer, it's it's questionable how much they knew and and what what was going on there. If they have valuable testimony to to offer, if you can successfully navigate any attorney client privilege issues that might exist there that they might claim exist there then I suppose that person is possible. And, you know, something that happens here is that there are a lot of lawyers in the mix, people who are acutely aware of the risk that they're exposed to. You would expect rationally that some of those people would flip. But Rudy Giuliani, John Eastman, Kenneth Cheesebro, the guy at the Justice Department who wanted to be attorney general, you oh, know, man. um uh, that guy. Jeffrey Clark, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, none of those folks, at least as far as we know, have flipped yet, and some of them are quite boisterous publicly and don't give the appearance of people who want to flip. Uh, Jeff, is Jeffrey Clark one of them? He's not he boisterous. He certainly has maintained a very um, proud profile on social media and in his television oh. appearances. So, you know, he does not look like a cooperator, but appearances can be deceiving. Okay, you guys. Well, um, to be continued, I suppose. I mean, when uh, just as as (laughs) when are we when is this going to (laughs) end? Asked and answered, counselor. Yes. I'll say this in fairness to you. Asked but not answered. And the answer is we don't know. I mean, clock's ticking, right? Well, yeah. Yes. I mean, there is an election coming up. You know, and this is, you know, we're we're uh, more than halfway there from the last presidential election to this coming presidential election. I think if you're at the Justice Department, you do have to be thinking realistically that, um, you know, if you charge this case, you have to anticipate that there will be a lot of time taken up in discovery, a lot of time taken up in motions because, you know, Trump, if he's charged, is going to file every motion under the sun to try to get this this case thrown out one way or the other. And then the trial itself will probably take a good bit of time because of the complexity of the case. And so are you going to have the bizarre scenario where Donald Trump is 
in trial by day and campaigning at a rally in you know Omaha, Nebraska by night. I think you want to get this thing complete by the end of the year, which means I think charges by the end of this quarter. That's what it seems like back timing it to me. So, uh, well, from your lips to God's ears, or from your lips to Jack Smith's ears, or <laughs> but, well, thank you guys. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, it was a great pleasure. Always a pleasure to talk to Joyce, and what a treat to talk to you, Al. Thank you. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.